I, I'm going to start. I'm going to start because I get to go first. Let's do it. Um, my right. name is Heather DeLol and I'm a librarian at Rider University and I am presenting today with my colleague, um, we'll let Ashley, go ahead, introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, I am Ashley Faith and I am uh, the director of Knowledge Graph and Semantic Search at EBSCO, but I am also a librarian of many years and I regularly work on machine learning projects. And I'm really excited to be here with these wonderful people from Rider University. And next is? And I'm Melissa Hoffman. I am the bibliographic control librarian among other duties and liaisons to several different departments like English and gender and sexuality studies. Okay, go ahead, Melissa. All right, so next slide, Heather. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, hi, and I'm Melissa, and as I mentioned, I'm the cataloging librarian, and I'm also an indexer for the MLA as a field bibliographer. So as you may guess from these two facts, I love subject headings. And as a librarian who also teaches information literacy at all levels, I know the importance of subject indexing for the end user. I witness how students search, and how badly these searches may go, and how easily students give up. This is why I always start out telling students to use the advanced search in a database so I can tell them um, better ways to search within a structured database, especially when you need to manage the number of results you're going to get in a discovery tool. I introduce them to Boolean searching immediately with the advanced search, even if I don't call it that. My goal is to get them from the keywords in their head to subject terms in the databases. And by doing this, I hope to get them thinking about broader, narrower, and related topics too. I compare results with the terms they use um, with, other with other terms in the databases that will get more results. For example, only certain articles and databases use the term body positivity, but the concept of body image yields many more results that they can work with. they may not think of the term body image starting out. So how do we get these additional terms? Uh, we used to teach brainstorming beforehand, but now I emphasize using the database to, to their advantage to do this. I point out how to find subject terms in the results list and the subject facet. So with a term like glass ceiling, it is a subject in many databases, so students will see the results. But what are the broader and related terms for this concept? Well, we can examine results, I tell them. They have to look, I say, beyond the first three results, and I hope at least examine several pages to see what may be relevant. I tell them that they should write down the terms and they can add them later to the existing search or create new searches. And then I model how to expand a search, either by working from the results or by brainstorming keywords. I emphasize limiting the subject when you know that a keyword, um, next slide, Heather. Oh, uh, sorry. Yep, is, uh, is a subject term. While glass ceiling is often a subject, sometimes it is not. The term might be only in the title, for example. Limiting the subject will thus eliminate relevant results. And I tell students to toggle subject on and off because not all terms in databases are equally indexed. There's the issue of subject specificity in book level versus article level indexing. So keywords are essential in retrieving words in the title, summary, and table of contents for items. Like this article would be excluded from the last search because glass ceiling is not a subject heading. It would also be excluded from my discrimination and employment search because the term discrimination is not used anywhere. Yet this result yields new subject terms that could be added to our search statement. The words vocational and occupational can potentially find more relevant items. With such examples, I emphasize the necessity to search in different ways with different search terms, combinations, and techniques, and the need to think broader, broader narrower, or relatedly. So by looking at uh, through the results and adding more subjects, I tell students that we can uh, ensure that by limiting two subject yield relevant but expansive results. Even though EBSCO databases have expanders that apply related words and equivalent subjects, this equivalency is not transparent. What terms are being searched? I tell the students we don't know, so we don't know what's being left out. But I love this feature because it is more or less a fail safe and students will find more results with simple keyword searches. Yet, even with equivalency, there are topics that get more results with explicit oring. 
But the million dollar question always is, will students actually do this librarian searching? I realize the entire process I teach requires effort and understanding, involves lots of scrolling, patience, and most importantly, the ability to make quick sense of an entry and render a judgment as to what may be useful. That is a tall order for novice scholars who may not know the forest for the trees and who are often looking for an article that answers their exact research question. The lay of the land, how their topic is named and how it relates to other topics might be beyond their easy understanding. Alternatively, and maybe more manageably, I also teach the subjects database, uh, the database subject facet allows users to see the related top subjects in a more concise view, but this is still a textual list to scroll through. And because the vocabulary is being pulled from multiple databases in a discovery tool, there is duplication here that the user may not understand, and they may not know what to do with such a list in terms of limiting. Okay, so I work with Melissa, as I said, at Rider University, and I love her teaching style, and I think she provides a great, excellent model of how things should be done. But I've been a primary instruction librarian for almost 20 years now, and sometimes I take shortcuts or I drop the emphasis on subjects, and I definitely can talk too fast in classes, and I used to cram too many learning objectives into one session. And sometimes I learned how ineffective that is because either students try to repeat everything I say or decide it's not important and skip the steps. I've always thought that this anecdotal evidence was something that all librarians have, but I'm gonna share some research that we did, really short clips of students verbalizing their research experience. There's like little to nothing on Congress when, you know, my professor was fairly, you know, adamant that there should be plenty, like, doesn't surprise me. So, you know, a graduate student who's been in my classes just has just typed in her keywords and then went on. And here there's like let's see, can we do advanced search? Yes, we can. So we will start with coal industry and let's go with and history. And because I want to find out the failures. So we will first go with failure in business because that's what I'm interested in. And maybe I can self build that as a subject term, both both of them, and coal industry as the title. That Oh, it says no results found. Why is that? Or maybe I'm supposed to do or here. Sometimes it's just changing. Certain words can help and yeah, it sure did. And let's see, whole industry present. And hopefully we come up with something good. Why don't I see anything related to coal? Let's see, can we do it? So uh, before Ashley speaks, just because that slide will replay, again, my student is searching for coal, unaware of Boolean search and just making up her own subject terms um, and just really floundering. And, you know, there's some confidence in her voice, but then she just gets frustrated. Okay, now we're going to turn it over to Ashley to talk about a um, possible solution. Solution. Well, yeah. hopefully something that can help at least. And so, actually, you have remote control, so you should be able to click. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so you might be asking yourself, you know, the title of, of this whole presentation is, is equitable search. So the way that we define that is, you know, making that bridge between the education and um, the information literacy that you saw Melissa and Heather talking about with the average everyday person and how they actually do their search. So the bridge between those two things, something that we have in the EBSCO Discovery Service is called the ESP, Enhanced Subject Precision. So we've had this for a while. So we know this was a problem from, from very early on where people didn't necessarily know the subject headings, regular users didn't know the subject headings uh, for a lot of different databases. So we have mapped all of those things together. And that's been uh, in the EBSCO Discovery Service, EDS, uh, for a few years now, so since 2014. Something I am incredibly happy and, and so excited about is, as of this year, it's already in search. 
is we are now using the user's natural language. The words that we know people are putting into the search bar and the words that you would use in discourse analysis, right? The discourse that you use with each other when you talk, that is the natural language that you use. If you wanna look up some information on that, Hobbes discourse analysis is something to go check out. And what we've done is we've taken a lot of that natural language and we've mapped it into all the synonyms that we already have for subject headings. So what this looks like is you can see here in this visual, we have magnetic levitation and that is the APA. And then we have the LCSH vocabulary, which is electromagnetic suspension. And then we have the natural language term, which is high speed train. You can also see Meglev is what is being typed into the search bar. So what we've done is we've bridged the gap between those the subjects and the words that people are typing into the search bar. We are putting it through that translation of all the different synonyms and natural language that people use, and we are connecting it to the content they are looking for. So the interesting thing is when we saw this, we thought, you know, a lot of this is how people, librarians, teach subject indexing and teach subject search on lots of different platforms. So we took it a step farther. All right, look, there we go. No, too far. You're gonna see all the secrets. There we go. All right, so the first thing that we were talking about is just mapping all of those synonyms together. So that is what you're seeing here. So in library science, we're very familiar with crosswalks. But you can see after you get to so many vocabularies, it gets really unmanageable. And so instead, what we use is a form of linked data. And I'm sure a lot of you know something about linked data at this point. It's been talked about in the library space uh, for quite some time. But now we're taking it into that semantic web aspect where we are using the red dot here as a concept to represent the universal understanding of, of something. So whether you call something gato or cat or feline, we have mapped all of those things together into this red dot. That's essentially what you're getting when you're doing a search in EDS. But then we started to ask ourselves, well, wait a minute. Now we can maybe look at how different subjects are related to one another. So the way that this works is we are looking at the vocabulary structures. So there's broader and narrower. Those are usually like a taxonomic kind of relation. And then we are looking at what is usually considered a thesaurus, which is the use for and see also. So these are all building on each other. So you have broader, narrower, use for, see also. And then we took it a step farther. And now we are looking at the other explicit relations between things. So if you were trying to figure out what is the capital of Pennsylvania, you would know it's Harrisburg because we have that connected with capital of as a relationship. These things are called triples. And this is basically what Tim Berners-Lee has been talking about for quite some time. So you can see some more examples here. So if I was looking for things on my research paper, uh, then I needed to talk about cancer, some, something that's related to cancer. I can find that lung cancer is a type of cancer. I can then also start to look for medications that are associated with lung cancer. And I can do this in a visual way. And that is actually what we're gonna be talking about today. So these visual examples, they do show up a lot on, on the web. Now, one thing I wanna make sure everybody is very aware of, they don't all do the same thing. They look similar, but that's like saying Google and EDS are similar. I mean, they both do searches, but for completely different reasons and for completely different persona. And so here, I'm just giving some examples of some other ones you wanna go check out. These are open source, so you can go and check these out. Uh, the one in the top, this is uh, actually really fun to play with. I love this visual. It, it makes subject searching fun and exciting. Uh, this one is the Marvel Universe. And you'll see in the bottom corner how the relations between people are represented. And those are those specific relationships. 
the one in the bottom corner, this is called Connected Papers. And a big shout out to Aaron Tay because he did a great presentation, a write up on some of these. So go check out his blog if you don't already have that. And this is showing how different creative works are related to one another. So those are totally different reasons to be looking at connections between different entities, but you can see they are represented in a very similar visual way. Okay, so, and this is introducing the EBSCO Discovery Service concept map. And here's the kicker, it's free. It's something that you can get if you are on EDS, if you are interested in trying it out today, let your EDS person know. Um, if you would love to talk to me about this stuff, I love talking to people about this because this is meant to help people do subject searches and to help the librarians teach subject searching. And so with that, I would love to turn it back over to my friends over at Rider University. Okay, so as uh, after a Ashley showed this to me and we explored, I alluded to before my, my teaching style may have encouraged students to only use keywords. And if the student looking for L Commerce was instructed to, to search, uh, was instructed to use the concept map and think about subjects at the beginning of her search, she would have seen that it's just not in the concept map and she would have been forced to take a step back, maybe looking for mobile commerce or M commerce. And so I'm starting to see how this could be a better experience for our users and would be the best way to show them how to search by browsing around first in an interface that makes connections. Uh, Melissa. Melissa. Yes. Okay. To return to the glass ceiling example, one second. Sorry about that. I had to mute myself. Um, <laughs> um, we can see the visual representation of related concepts. Clicking on the no glass ceiling gives us a definition of the concept and domain. It also gathers the related terms, but we still can't see the equivalency of subject terms here because of proprietary reasons. However, this concept map has the potential to help students explore and bro broaden and narrow their topics. From glass ceiling, I can click on the concept women in the workforce and get a definition. I can click this term to add it to my search in the upper right. It's anded automatically. By clicking the and, I can change it to or. I can then preview my results with content preview or by clicking on see full results, open the results in EDS. On our preliminary exploration, the concept map looks like it can be helpful to both novice and experienced researchers. While searching for plagiarism, multiple choices show a distinct concept map for plagiarism, plagiarism in art, and music plagiarism. And this will help me frame how I teach, but having having students to explore a concept map. Um, but there is no way that there is no way this tool can resolve the need for us to teach students to use a variety of subject terms still. Some databases may use other subjects like music plagiarism might not be linked to intellectual property or copyright infringement. Let me illustrate what Heather just said. The following is an example from a session I taught just the other week for a section of our research writing, um, which is part of our composition program. I wanted to see how the concept map would work alongside the traditional way I teach. The assignment was to find out if a student's assigned person plagiarized or not. I taught the basic formula for the, for, for the search to be the person's name and plagiarism. Such a search for a per person who was a musician, such as Robin Thicke with the term plagiarism only yielded six results. So with the term from the concept map, music plagiarism, the results were only seven. I thus showed the students how to look through the results as normal to see what other subject terms are being used for this topic, like intellectual property and copyright. Combining these terms into a new search yields 238 results. Remember, our results were six and seven before. The fact that the, the results from music plagiarism and plagiarism are so close tell me that behind the scenes, there is no thesaurus equivalency between these two terms and the other subjects used to describe it as to make sense because copyright and intellectual property are related terms and not equivalencies. But it is interesting here that the, the term, the concept of music plagiarism is not a widely used subject term, even though it's a concept in the concept map. Um, so I wanted to see how the concept map would represent the relationships between the more prevalent subject terms I found. So I tried it. So here we start with music plagiarism. 
One of the nodes off of music plagiarism is copyright infringement. Exploring copyright infringement, I don't see the term intellectual property connected here. You have to click on the related term copyright to get to intellectual property. So these concepts are available here for students to explore, along with many others that may be helpful in shaping their understanding of the topic. Well, they may not know which concepts are potentially subject terms or what subject terms equivalency EBSCO has mapped to each concept behind the scenes, researchers can gain an idea of broader and related concepts in a visually appealing way that also yields definitions, the domains of the concept, and its specific relations to other concepts. Being able to browse these concepts, preview the results, and then construct a complex search statement right from the concept map tool is a definite benefit. And I can see how I can envision incorporating this into my formal research instruction and my general research assistance when I'm at the reference desk. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot, a lot of thoughtful design behind this concept map, proving to me that the developers at EBSCO are user and librarian focused. And this collaboration that Melissa and I had with Ashley has provided us an opportunity to share more frontline librarian insight with a data science who actually totally understands librarian jargon while this tool is being developed. And uh, since we're good on time, I'm just going to add Ashley, you know, she was going to say this and she didn't like when she got to EBSCO, she said, how can we make this more fun? How can we work on this? And, and she does have to work a bit with her developers, she admitted, to you know really understand. Um, and she's done a lot of great work going forward with this. And so, you know, um, we're not we're not EBSCO salespeople, Melissa and I. We've just enjoyed this collaboration and we got really excited about this tool once we found out about it. And I'm super excited that we have time for questions. I just have to say, you guys are too kind. Thank you so much. <laughs> a lot and, of work here. Yeah, this is a this is a work in progress. I mean, we want to listen to how librarians teach this. I think everybody teaches it slightly different, and you know, as we talk to more people, we can do better. And I, I would love to talk to all of you about that. So I I can see there's something in the Zoom chat. It says, "Can ans can answered be at the end? Will the slides be shared?" Sure, we can slide the shared uh, mm -hmm. the slides. Can we put that up on the Pathable website? I believe we can. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and do that. And our notes are there too. So we'll be happy with that. Uh, I just got another question. This is Kate, and I'll paste it in the chat as well. Uh, how do you get to the concept map from the EDS search screen? So if you have it enabled, you have to ask to have it turned on. Um, and it's it's pretty painless. They just do, do it for you. <laughs> Um, you will see it, uh, it's going to be near the three bars where you can put in um, your search. It's going to be right next to that. And if you are um, somebody that's working on the, the new uh, EDS interface that we have, it's gonna be on the left side with a lot of the other tools. Awesome, we have a, another question. Uh, from Chandler, uh, this for our librarians. Uh, this seems like it could be a challenge to teach. What did you learn about how to teach to students with this tool? I love that question. So it's, it's tough to teach why this is in the library because um, I actually tried teaching this to my 12 year old niece who doesn't uh, really know much about libraries yet, but she loves books. And in fact, what she said to me when I showed it to her and what it can do, she said, Aunt Ashley, you made a video game for the library, <laughs> which I loved. I loved that. that my, I'm, I'm the hero of my you know, niece because I made a video game for the library. Um, so the way that I teach this, um, we are, and I'm actually, because I've done the reference desk, I've been a special librarian. Um, I'm actually doing a lot of those teaching recordings um, that you can use. And the way that I, I usually present this is, you know, if you are trying to go deeper, if you want to find more specific subjects, this is a great one to look at. And then I show, there's actually a tutorial um, in the visual that you can look at as well. And the second thing that I can do is if you are, if you've been given a topic and you need to find something that is unique about that topic, like cancer, what are different things related to cancer that you could write your research on? So those are the two main use cases that we see with students. Um, can I, 
I'm yeah. going to interject yeah. because so um, just as somebody who is um, I haven't actually had a class where I've been able to teach this yet, but I have one coming up in a couple of weeks. And here's what I'm going to try to do. And I have two different classes, so I'm really tempted, same professor, to do one this way and one the other way. But like, it'll enable me to have an easier way to have that conversation that I've had about subjects and different terms. Because what we've been doing, as you de Melissa demonstrated, is make them go through the results and find these different terms. And I'm hoping that the concept map will bring it together to me in and just, I mean, like a cool power, better than a PowerPoint. I know I don't want to say that, but I just really feel like it just will enable me to show it to them and then empower them to go forward. So instead of doing a quick keyword search, they might pre-think their search ahead of time. They might actually be reflective because I am teaching in a class where I have like 30 minutes, I'm going to lose their attention because we're on Zoom. Okay. And, and I haven't taught it yet exactly either, um, but there's been so many examples teaching virtually this semester where I've had this, the, you would think that the topic would be easy to find papers on, but it's like either the results are too overwhelming or they're not exactly what the student wants. So like one on government and power and the other one was on like group thinking and our group dynamics. And I'm thinking this help, helping them focus on what domain they should be in maybe would also then help them think about what database they should be searching in more specifically or just helping them focus their search a little more on these really broad topics that they may not think with other terms. And you know, some of these, I it took me like hours to figure out what the subject terms were as the expert librarian. And I'm wondering how that experience might have changed or how my thinking might have changed looking at the concept map first and directing them there. Um, and so that's something I'm going to explore further. And I can't uh, wait, because then we'll be presenting with Ashley about how that went, you know? Yeah. <laughs> We've got one more question. We've got four more minutes and one more question coming in um, from, uh, let's see, how are selections among the concept map nodes related to searches recorded in the search history list? Mm -hmm. Search history is an underappreciated function across our business um, is something that, that someone has asked. Hmm. So I'm going to try to repeat that because it sounds yeah. like there's how so that, a lot to unpack. So. Are, um, is the question, how do the concept map um, things relate to what you see in, um, in the search history? Is that? I think so. Yeah, okay. That's what it sounds like. Please, yes, that is correct. Yes, okay. <laughs> So um, we are actively um, working on integrating more of the smarts that we already have um, built into like the how two things are related to each other into that search history. But the other thing we're doing is the, the, the um, reverse of that, which is we are looking at the um, search log history and it's, it's all anonymous. It's just what is um, showing up the most. And we are then um, using our subject matter experts to um, people that have degrees in biology, people that you know have an understanding of how um, you know classification works, people that also kind of understand the library space, to um, take those those um, synonyms essentially from the real users and then put those in as a secondary mapping for um, for synonyms in those concepts. Does that answer the question? Find out. I hope. Yeah, I was like, mostly mm -hmm. is the answer. Uh <laughs> well, well Ashley this. is totally emailable. So yes, that's what I was gonna say. Time and and she'll probably write you back a much or you know even meet with you. I don't know. I'm just offering Ashley. <laughs> no, and I I do that all the time. So I mean, I I am the 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 person that's behind the scenes, not the only person by any means, um, that's behind the scenes on on a lot of this stuff. You know, I don't work on the sales team. I'm just um, technologist and librarian. And I love talking to people about, you know, the problems that they see and the things that they are struggling with when they're teaching to students and what are the students actually struggling with. You know, I, I do a lot of um, research with the students themselves um, from a number of different um, types of libraries. So I am 100% willing to talk to you, get on a call. I've also done training with people on the concept map. So that's also something if you just, you know, want 
to to talk about that. I'm 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 up for it. Okay, and I'm going to post the slides right now, but I do need to take down those two videos. Just even though it'll be in the recording, just IRB safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Although it's well, in the recording, so whoops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh, online conferences. Uh, so thank you guys both so much. I, um, we're at three o'clock, so time to, we're still getting more questions, but I will uh, grab those and hopefully get those to you guys at a later date. Uh, well, we, we can respond to them in Pathable, I believe. You can? I think so. Yes. So we okay, have great. more questions in Pathable, so check it out. Um, but that is the end of the session. So thanks everyone so much thank for you, attending. Kate. Thank you for thank coming. You. Thanks all. All right. all right. Thanks everyone.